Dr. Kerbans, thank you very much for making the time to help me with this PhD research that I'm doing, which is titled Into the Heart of Systems Change. And that is really to you know, better understand also the transformational processes of the different societal systems and personal systems. And there's one chapter in particular that I'm working on and that is concerns learning and development and the behavioral systems appropriate for learning and development. Now, I know that you are your psychologist, you're a therapist, you're also trained and certified in biofeedback um, and a psychosocial expert. And it's your daily job <laughs> to support people you know, through that behavioral change and as well to come into what you've called the learner's mind and for people to be receptive as well to the proper instruction um, so that necessary behavioral changes for their flourishing can take place. So it really uh, will help me in the research if I may ask you a few questions to better understand this receptivity. Would that be okay with you? Yes, of course. Great. Then the first thing that I'd like your um, feedback on and insight about is that you've mentioned in some of your trainings as well that how exposure to new information requires a behavioral system that is receptive to this information. And in your work, you've also mentioned that this receptivity can be measured and that you have measured this with your patients via biofeedback machines that can show the brainwave patterns via beta, delta, theta, and alpha waves. Um, and that in this research as well, uh, and your, you know, your professional experience through all the therapy that you've conducted, that it can therefore show when a person is receptive to new information and open to learn it. Could you share with us a little bit more about this? Yes. Uh, first of all, it's not just me. This has been done before me by Maxwell Cade, Jeff Blundell, and many other persons that were involved into this sort of training with what we call the mind mirror, which is in fact an EEG specially conceived that allows you to see um, your right hemisphere and your left hemisphere emitting their brain waves. And you can see thereby what is happening at the different levels, like in the beta waves, in the alpha waves, in the theta waves, and the delta waves. So you can see, for instance, when someone is about to start something new as a student, for instance, one of the two hemispheres might block completely, while the other one will sort of have a flare of beta. Now, the art is about helping this person to decrease this beta flare and start producing some alpha is also, it seems, corresponding to the reduction of this beta wave. So you would see suddenly a bigger and bigger expression of the alpha waves. An alpha wave can be obtained in a very simple manner, which is just simply closing your eyes would normally induce an alpha wave. So by using different form of techniques such as relaxation techniques, guided imagery techniques, you can there enhance this alpha wave. And when this alpha wave is there, the person has become much more receptive to whatever it is that you're going to impart as knowledge to the other one. So to change this, you can use these various relaxation techniques. As I said, I mentioned stress, you can also measure in a different way, which is through the galvanic response, that is electricity that you have in your body, and by seeing how it reacts, you would see if the person is excessively stressed and therefore is not receptive to any form of knowledge that you're going to partake. So, there again, you can help the person get into that state of relaxation. In fact, some other research have been made whereby people attempted, you might have heard of this, of learning into 
sleep, or relaxation state. The whole idea is just simply to get rid of this filter of the beta wave. However, what we also find out is that in the best state of receptivity, you don't have a complete absence of beta wave. You have some beta wave, plus the alpha wave, and also the theta wave, which corresponds more to imagery. This is why someone is more likely to retain the knowledge that you're trying to transmit if you have it in form of pictures, in form of symbols, so that the person can visualize what you're talking about. Then it sinks in better and faster, and it stimulates also, therefore, the tether waves. And you gradually end up with a specific pattern that we call the fifth state pattern, in which you would have some beta waves, a lot of alpha waves, and some theta waves as well. So this might help you into understanding how actually the waves indicate what is happening and also how you may change it so that the person would learn better. Because it's the learning has to do definitely with having less of these better players, which also correspond, as I just said, to less stress, the person being more relaxed. And now understanding, which is also a different state from just learning, that this is a state where you might need to have again some better waves which would help you to analyze and integrate what is required for you to make this knowledge yours, not just for it to be something outside that you've been learning and that you could give back as a parrot, but as something that you have actually understood. Thank you, that's very useful. And it seems to me that this insight is not applied enough, especially in schools, because we expose children to a lot of information. And from if I understand this correctly, if there's high levels of stress, then there might also be certain levels of blocking to that information. And then exposing them to more information isn't going to get the results. Definitely not. Exposing to more information is not the answer exposing to a different type of information, that is how the information is parted with. What is the ambiance, you might say, in which this information is transmitted would make all the difference. It's just as if you watching a nice movie or you watching a very flat movie or even an horror movie majority of people would not react well to it. However, we know that in learning, then an aspect known as emotion, which can help the person learn better and therefore help to harmonize this reception, make it stronger and deeper. Thank you. And there is one more aspect of learning that I'd love your feedback on. And it's also based on some of the research that comes out of my PhD. And it's also based on experimental research from Dr. Art Smitsman uh, with young infants. And what in his research, what it was showing is that young infants learning ability um, is both that receptive state that you just mentioned, in which he talks about as the capacity to attune to information within and in the environment, but also then the active exploration of doing something with that information and that that exploration doesn't necessarily start to happen when children are being taught what to do, that, that we rather need to create these conditions. So you mentioned that state of relaxation. Now in, in your work, in order for people to come now from that receptivity to that more active state of exploration. Um, what have you noticed about that? There you have the very concept of play. By having 
a role play, the child is more likely to integrate the knowledge. One, because he's not under the stress of thinking that he has to learn and deliver some kind of appropriate answer to pass an exam, but that is just simply playing, getting along with it. So while he's playing, he's doing as if. That helps him to integrate the skills that you want him to learn. He's learning it not only by having uh, at the end of it a gift, which is the, the gift that is passed the exam or such a thing. It's also a gift of succeeding, of having some kind of personal happiness of having done something. However, this might not be enough to stimulate some children to learn. So it's much easier in the majority of cases just to let the children go around, see what's going on, observe, start to copy what the others are doing by playing, doing as if. In my kindergarten school, we have been for about 15 years observing that. We let the new kids come in. They are around two and a half. And they do as they please. We don't force them. We let them go around, see what the elders are doing. And when they feel ready that they want, to do as the others, sit down, draw, or do other things, we encourage them. And that produces fantastic results. We have, just by doing that, realized that children have been able to jump at school one class level completely, just simply by letting them come to their own rhythm when they are happy to do as the others, to play like the others, to do as if they are becoming older, elderly, then it unblocks. While if you try to hit them and make them do it, they block into a panic state where you have a terrible better flare, which is going to lead nowhere. Thank you for explaining that. And that brings me to my final question. And that is what this research also is about is how can we enhance the learning capacity as a society, especially with regards to stopping runaway climate change, stopping our acrogenocide. You just mentioned earlier that when we are in this panic state, there is a blocking mechanism going on. So a lot of the information that is around at the moment through the news and social media seems to invoke that panic state um, and with an expectation that if people perhaps panic, then they see the seriousness and maybe then we'll have to behavioral change. But what I'm uh, learning from you today is that that is not necessarily uh, a factor to trigger that kind of appropriate behavioral change. So if you were to, could you give us some insight or what are your views with regards to enhancing the learning capacity at the societal level for us to have the required behavioral change to do something <laughs> in a good manner about what's going on. What are your views? If we let things go according to the techniques we've been using now, it can only get worse. In as much as some recent research have indicated that each time that the climate changes is forecasted for one degree of rising, you'd have 2% of mental illness going up in the population. Which means that if you just leave it like that, the change won't happen in a positive manner. It's more happening in a negative manner. In their panic, it gets worse. The thinking is not clear. And people being people, they're not ready to give away the comfort that they feel entitled to. Especially if they've never had anything before. 
ask someone who's never had a fridge that is not entitled to have a fridge because of climate change, it's going to be hard for him to, to understand that. So there again, if you use techniques such as they have been using that in some of the Nordic countries again, as copying, as playing the roles, if you play roles as if you are indeed in the desperate situation, you make children play that, they would quickly understand what's going on and what they should do and how they should react. But if you try to put down their throat a lot of mathematical uh, equation, a lot of scientific forecasts, it will go nowhere. especially if they have against that their own improvement of comfort. While if you put them in a situation whereby they leave what it is when it's so hot and that you have nothing to drink, then they understand what is happening and they might want to do something right away. So there again, putting someone in a situation where they can do as if helps the mind, the body to integrate what is really going on. They get not to learn, but to understand which is one step further. I hope this helps. This helps a lot. And I think what I'm going to explore further then, and as a takeaway from what you just shared, is that we also need to very well understand that behavioral state of problem solving in a creative, innovative manner. Because what I've learned from you today is that by actually you know, modeling those states, behavioral states, and really coming into that, you come into a particular stance and that stance in itself. So it's like if you take in that stance of the solutions that we are seeking, so you actually adopt that stance, that also helps us then to be open to the information that we may otherwise be missing out on. So what you've shared is very insightful and uh, I thank you very much for your contribution to this research. My pleasure, wish you well. Thank you.